This lecture looks at probably one of the most important parts of society, and that is the culture within the society itself. Culture answers the question that'll go, one of the questions that Auguste Comte asked. He asked, what holds a society together? And one of the things that we'll see that is the glue that holds the society together is its culture. Uh, we're going to look at several parts of chapter three. We're gonna look at what is culture and why is it important. Uh, very briefly, we'll look at uh, the three major theoretical perspectives to see how they would look at culture. And then finally, I'm going to walk through each of the components of culture, um, material culture and non-material culture and see if we can give examples and explanation to each of the parts of culture. What is culture? Here I bring back my example of the tree. The tree has all of these parts to it. It has a um, structure that the certain type of tree, but within that structure, is a, is a way of life. It is something that the parts of the, the people, the parts of the uh, tree have decided is the way that they are going to live. It's not a decision that everybody gets together and votes. It's a gradual process of adapting to the environment. So as people moved from one environment to another, they would take parts of their culture with them, but they would also pick up other ways of doing things or looking at things that help them to survive in that particular environment. So culture can be called a way of life. Sometimes we just take it for granted uh, because it's been with us since the day we were born. And so we don't think too much about it but it is not a biological part of us. It is something that we have to learn. And we gradually learn all of the parts of culture. Again, we may not realize that we're doing it, but it's something that we share with the people around us because those are the people that we are learning our culture from. So it's not biological, it's learned. Second, it's our identity in the social world. That is extremely important. So we are dealing both on a very macro level, but also on a very micro level. It gives us a sense of who we are. Um, who do we share things with? We are part of this group. As we go through, we'll also see that it's the lens through which we evaluate the things around us. It gives us our sense of right and wrong. That's what we refer to as values. So that's gonna be very important to look at. So culture is really, again, the glue that holds a group together and makes them who they are as individuals and as a society. How important is this? Well, I think the fact that it is our identity is what makes it the most important thing that we see. Uh, some of the words on this page uh, reflect that sense of identity. Ethnocentrism uh, is a term that we use when people use their own culture as a standard to evaluate another group or individual. How often do we see that? This is the we versus they um, part of cultures or societies being different. Sometimes it leads to xenocentrism, the view that our culture is the superior one. The opposite of that is what we call cultural relativity. In other words, trying to view a culture in its own terms uh, rather than seeing our group as superior. But again, if you have traveled to other countries, you probably have experienced this next term, culture shock. Uh, I sometimes call it homesickness. When we come into contact with a different culture, we are sometimes very disoriented. We sometimes are confused, lost. Um, we don't know what to do. We wonder why do they do things this way? 
Um, sometimes if you are um, in a country for a period of time, you experience this homesickness. I just want to go home and be with the things that I am familiar with. This is particularly true of food uh, language, unless you speak the other country's language very fluently, it's going to be very difficult for you to express yourself or to understand people in the way you would in your own country. So we become very disoriented. There's another term which shows how important culture is. It comes from probably the period of colonialism, what we call cultural imperialism, the deliberate imposition of one's culture on another society. Certainly the colonial powers of Europe went into other countries and tried to do that. We are still trying to do that as we go into this economic interconnectedness. Um, the assumption is, well, everybody's got to speak English um, and we're going to bring our economic system into their country, even if their culture does not approve of capitalism, which is true of some parts of the world. So each of our theoretical perspectives that we have been looking at um, looks at culture in a little different way. The structural functionalists would see it in terms of function. What does culture do for society? Well, as we pointed out, um, it holds it together uh, and allows people to share a sense of identity. The social conflict people are going to see it a little bit differently. They start with the type of economy, whether it is a hunting gathering that we talked about or whether it is a uh, post-industrial society. They're going to see that there is a certain elite which is going to use the culture going to put certain parts of the culture together to perpetuate the inequalities that exist. So we might look at culture from that point of view. The symbolic interactionists, of course, are going to see culture as being created and maintained or changed. We'll look at social change also. Um, but this culture is created uh, by social interaction, people over a period of time, begin to share a certain way of living. And they do this by interacting together. As pointed out in the textbook, there are uh, two major components of culture, the material culture, and then the non-material, or sometimes non-material, is called the symbolic culture. So we'll briefly talk about each one of these parts. I think the most important is the symbolic or non-material culture. I think the first major part, the material culture, um, which are all the material objects associated with the society, uh, including the technology. That's very important too, but perhaps because my perspective is more symbolic interactionist, um, I do see all of these symbolic or non-material parts as being so important to how we behave. Here are just some examples of material culture. Um, certainly the technology of the computer uh, versus the abacus, which was is still used in many cultures, uh, but was one of the early uh, types of adding machines. Okay. We see certain types of housing, we see clothes, we see um, musical instruments, we see ways of transportation. All of these are examples of material culture. And like I said, very important, but I think they more reflect the non-material or maybe they're the background for the non-material. As we saw in the earlier slide, the non-material culture has many parts to it. We'll start with the beliefs, because I think beliefs are extremely important. They're at the core of a culture. We often think of them maybe as a religion or as ceremonies which celebrate a basic belief that the people have as to how they are 
related to this larger world, the social environment, but also a physical environment that they live in. Okay? So this belief system forms the core of the culture. Values and norms follow these core beliefs. Um, for example, and I'm using the uh, Denka tribe in Africa, specifically in Sudan, South Sudan in that area. Uh, these are people who have always lived uh, in a farming community, unfortunately torn apart now by civil war. But these are groups which trace their sense of identity back to the farming, herding society that they lived in. They saw the creator as a father or mother figure, either one, it didn't really matter to them. So their language has no gender categories, which I find to be very interesting, that even from this tradition that they've established, it goes all the way down through their values and norms to their language. They celebrate their ancestors, um, they call them the living dead, using sacrifices of cattle, cattle herding, very important to the Dinka tradition. Okay, so even today, where they are living in a society that has become much more modernized, these beliefs, these traditions remain with them in their language, in their types of holidays or ceremonies, even though they, many of them have converted to Christianity. They have worked these traditions into a new part of their culture. The same thing is true of American society. Um, the American dream, quote unquote, uh, comes from the Protestant religious ethic. This idea of um, uh, Protestants believe you had to work hard to get into heaven, all of these um, types of things that a lot of people today, of course, are not Protestant. They are not religious in that going to church every week. But this ethic has become a cultural value to work hard. Okay? And the schools that were established by the early religious leaders in the eastern part of American society as it started to move westward, these were all from a belief system that they were going to establish um, a perfect society. And so they established many of these things to help people. Also very important to communication between uh, people within a society are symbols or gestures. Uh, symbols or gestures are using our body or um, certain objects to represent something else. Okay. Um, it could be a gesture, it could be a posture, a tone of voice. Uh, it could be, mater again, material objects used to represent something else. These are very arbitrary. They do come out of the society. We might not understand another culture's symbols or gestures. And because they are part of the entire society, they become collective. It becomes part of what everyone understands. This little boy has his thumbs up. Um, sometimes we use an okay sign, putting our uh, forefinger and thumb together. That's an okay sign in American society. That is a very um, obscene gesture in another culture, in other cultures, usually more traditional cultures. All right, so you can see that these are very arbitrary, but there is a collective sense of the society understanding what is meant by them. That's why sometimes when we travel, that sense of culture shock that I talked about can be very um, disorienting with gestures or symbols because we take them for granted. Here are some examples that show us um, really how important gestures and symbols can be. Um, we see um, these, I've used the last three presidents uh, to be very nonpartisan about the whole thing. We see uh, President Obama making a gesture to the Emperor of Japan. Um, he bowed. He was very often criticized for that because people didn't feel that an American president should bow to another 
uh, leader of another country. Uh, but I think Obama had been raised in uh, some of the um, Southeast Asian societies. His mother had been a um, Peace Corps worker. And so he had been raised for a period of time and kind of took it for granted that this was a, a gesture of respect. Okay? Now, if we look at President Bush, if you'd notice very carefully, he is holding hands with this particular person. I think it's from, I'm not quite sure don't, that I remember either Saudi Arabia, um, Yemen or whatever, but in the Middle East, um, the tradition is that men hold hands, particularly in public. Right? Men and women do not hold hands in public. That is not allowed, the touching between men and women in these traditional societies. But for men, holding hands is a way of showing friendship, that I am your ally. And so that's what President Bush was essentially doing. He was saying, I am your friend, I am your ally. And this was a very important public gesture to make. Okay, President Trump does the same thing when he is in Saudi Arabia. He is invited to participate in a war dance. Now, in American society, the president would not be holding a sword, but in this country, it is his way of showing respect for their culture. Okay. So these uh, gestures or symbols are very important uh, in everyday life. Think about what would be uh, required of you symbolically or, or gestures of, to be successful. Suppose you were going on a job interview. How would you be dressed? What are you trying to convey? What is the message? Um, you know, would you shake hands with everyone who is going to interview you? Uh, so you have to think again about how you present by using symbols or gestures. Very important. The next thing I want to talk about is language because it's like a step up from symbols. It's taking a lot of symbols and putting them together. Uh, but I love this quote. It is from Khalid Hassini, who wrote The Kite Runner. Uh, he also wrote several other books. And if you have not read them, I recommend to understand Afghanistan, to understand some of the last 20 years, read his books. They are fiction books, wonderful to read. But here is a quote from um, his book called And the Mountains Echoed. I think it was the second one. Um, he said, quote, my father told me, if culture was a house, then language was the key to the front door, to all the rooms inside. Without it, he said, you ended up wayward, without a proper home or a legitimate identity. And that's, to me, says the importance of language. Okay, so what is language and why is it, is it that important? It is symbols, of course, to which a group of people attach a particular meaning. So they're putting all of these sounds together, um, maybe um, symbols when it can be written, uh, things that the group as a whole understand to convey a certain meaning. It becomes the chief factor to transmitting culture. Don't forget, since culture is learned, we must pass it down from generation to generation. Language is not the only thing but it is certainly a huge factor. When we look at Africa we are today, we are beginning to understand their history because we're beginning to understand the way they transmitted their culture through symbols and eventually a language that was mostly spoken, but very important to transmitting culture. So it allows the human experiences to have a history, to be cumulative. It shares experiences of both the past, the present, and the future. There are a few languages left, I think the Maasai in, um, in Africa, that do not have a future tense. They do have a past and a present, but not a future. Uh, so interesting to understanding their culture. Language allows a more complex thought and this common understanding that we have with each other. But probably one of the most important things to me is it gives us our perceptions of reality. Again, this is something that the symbolic interactionists would pick up on. 
What do you mean it gives us a perception of reality? So let's look at that more carefully. Okay, this idea of the perception or language giving us our perceptions is referred to as the Shapiro-Whorf hypothesis or sometimes called linguistic relativity. These were two men who were studying uh, Native American tribes, also some of the Inuit or Eskimo in, um, in Alaska and Canada. And one of the things they noticed was that there were some words in their language that did not exist in other languages. For example, the Eskimo has many words for snow. We who live in Southern California, to us snow is you know, the white stuff that we see up on the mountain sometimes. But to the Eskimo who has to live with snow every day, there is many different words. There's a word for the first snow of the season. There's a word for um, a hard storm. Uh, there's a word for uh, a gentle snow that is just the tiny snowflakes. They also tell distance by snow. Certain types of snow would take you a longer time to get to your destination than a different type of snow. So all of these words help these people to understand the environment in which they live. Okay. So for example, if we see something, we give it a name. We tell a child that is a cat. Um, and so a child now sees this. If, uh, if the child calls everything that is furry a cat, we now begin to differentiate for that child. Oh, no, this is a cat. This is a skunk. This is, a, you know, something else over here. Um, and so we begin to categorize things and we begin to see them by the language that we learn. So that if you go into a different country, the words sometimes are words that you don't have any image for. For example, you know, when I'm eating Chinese food and I said to the waiter, uh, what is um, this green, you know, stuff? And he said, it's bok choy. He said, it's like, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of like a cabbage. No, not really. It's bok choy. In other words, that's the image that goes with that word. And it's sometimes hard to translate it into another language. So to understand how people see reality, it's really important to learn the language. And that's something that we don't do a lot of in American society. Somehow we have this thing about uh, everybody should speak the same language uh, rather than look, teaching our children other languages at a very early age when it's easier for them to learn it. So that's why I think language is probably the most important thing that we think of in the symbolic or non-material culture. Okay, the next part of culture are values. They come from <clears throat> the beliefs that we talked about first, um, what people hold to be true or important. In other words, it's a way of thinking. I'm stressing this because it's different than the next thing we're going to look at, which is behavior. So values are ideas shared by people and society regarding what is important, good or bad, pretty or ugly. They can be uh, positive or negative. You should do this, or this is important, or this is not important, or this is bad, or this is good. Again, it's very, it's learned. It's not uh, biological. It's something that we have to uh, teach our children, okay? And again, it's relative to uh, every society. I will tell you this, that values generally reflect an ideal society, an ideal culture, an ideal belief system. For example, we certainly believe in equality, okay? But we also believe, or we practice in the real culture, what is called group superiority. These are two conflicting values that American society has. 
And I think it's hard sometimes for people um, to understand how can you believe two different things? Well, that's the real culture and that's the complicated world that we live in today. Uh, studies have shown um, some persistent, uh, you know, over the years, some persistent core values of American society. These are just some of them. There are more. I'm sure you can think of a lot more. But at the top of the list always seems to be achievement and success. In American society, this is what we value. This is what we think is good or important. We also believe in individualism, which kind of can be a... Um, a conflicting value also because we believe in the family, uh, that the family is important, but I am important too. So there can be a contradiction along the way. So individualism, hard work, freedom, democracy, and here are the two that I just talked about, equality, everyone is, should be equal, uh, but my group is better than your group. And there seems to always be this contradiction uh, that somehow has become part of the core values of American society. Now, if you have these values, um, you have to live every day. So how do these values become translated into your behavior? This is what we call norms, the rules of behavior that develop out of a group's values. Uh, these norms can be very um, formal in the society. In other words, it could be something that the society recognizes and teaches as a formal uh, way of doing things. These are usually put into the laws or the more um, generally agreed upon things, or they can be very informal, just what you learn from your friends. Okay? Generally, how we enforce these norms are through sanctions. This is what we establish as social control. Um, we might punish our children. We might praise our children. So the sanctions can be positive or negative. We can give awards to people in the society or we can put them in jail. So things can be very strict, very, uh, as I said, formal, or they can be less formal just saying something like, good job, or uh, you were a good boy today. That's a positive reinforcement or sanction for the way that people behave. Okay. Now, obviously, these norms can vary in level of importance to society. The folk ways are the more informal, the generally uh, lower level, just saying please and thank you. But as we go up the continuum, things get much more serious. The mores are the ones that usually the society steps in and tries to uh, reinforce or to sanction. Mores would be something like um, driving, you know, the traffic laws. Uh, we have to obey. Um, what would we do without traffic laws? Uh, just think about how important they are. But also they become more serious like um, we do not think murder is appropriate. At one time in a society, if somebody did something to your family, um, you went out and took revenge, you know, a vendetta. But as societies begin to develop and to structure more, um, they set up rules that the, that the society itself um, enforced. Usually, again, these are laws that are officially sanctioned by the society. Right? At the extreme level are what are sometimes referred to as taboos. This would be things like incest. Uh, we know, of course, that someone who uh, is a pedophile is not even safe when they go to jail. So these are the taboos of the society. Incest, pedophilia, um, cannibalism. These are things that would not be accepted even by the people who are in prison or have been officially sanctioned. Again, just some uh, pictures that I took. Uh, I was in China in 2007, and these are just some examples of 
I guess, norms and symbols, gestures in different countries. Uh, the first one at the top left would be the little boy. If you notice his haircut, um, it symbolizes uh, Buddhism. Now, China does not recognize any religion officially, but people do practice uh, their traditions. Maybe they're not practicing Buddhism, but this haircut is a tradition that has been passed down in the family. And so the little boy has um, his haircut, okay? Now, if you look right below him, um, this was a picture that I took that my husband accused me of stalking the people because I so wanted the picture of this woman carrying the child. Okay, now let me maybe use a pointer. Um, where I am particularly focusing you to is the baby right here. Can you see that the baby is not wearing a diaper? Okay. If you look again up at the little boy in the picture above, he is what is called the split pants age. In other words, he is not potty trained, uh, but he is not wearing a diaper either. Uh, his pants are split at the bottom, if you can see that, okay? So this is a tradition, and what our uh, guide said about this woman um, and, the, and the baby, he said, oh, they're probably from a rural part of China, and they're here. Uh, we were at the Temple of Heaven. He said they're probably here on a tourist, uh, just you know, visiting. Uh, he said, because in the cities, we are now not practicing this use of the split pants or the use of the um, not we're well, not wearing diapers. He's, so it could be that they are a rural front part. But again, I'm so fascinated that um, a baby does not wear diapers or anything like that until it becomes potty trained at a later age. It's, I just thought it was fascinating. Okay, if we go up to the top right, this is a picture of people dancing in the park. You can see that maybe they're on a, a lunch break or whatever, but they put their purse and uh, other supplies here by the tree and they dance to the music. This is something that you very often see in parks in China. You also see extra large exercise groups. So there's a lot more group activity in public places. Uh, the last picture I'll show you is a man washing his clothes. Um, he is, again, he doesn't, he's not doing anything that's unusual in this country. You see a lot of people by the, um, the local watering places or the canals washing their clothes. And probably because at that time they did not have laundry facilities in the house. I know that people sometimes uh, get very confused between values and norms. So I try to show this and I'm just you know, giving you examples of what is a value and how it translates to a norm. A value is an attitude in your head. Um, the norms are behaviors. Okay, so if you value honesty, then the behavior, you don't tell lies. If you value respect, you say things like please and thank you. If you value success, then your behavior would be to obtain a lot of money and material goods. There are different ways of doing that, but again, this is where we start to get into the conflicting values. Um, maybe someone would obtain that money illegally, even though they believe that they should be honest and obey the laws. Okay, so there is confliction. Here is the last one that I talked about. Family, put family first before your individual needs or interests. And of course, individualism is me first. Um, so that can be a, a conflicting values. And again, how we work them out is an everyday process. Okay, I've tried to put culture together for you. I think it's very important. I call it the glue that holds society together. Um, most important, it gives us identity and a sense of we, but that can be negative as well as positive. Okay. It's, it can cause conflict if it becomes too much of the we, they. There are two major components of culture, they're the material and the non-material. And under the non-material, we talked about beliefs, symbols, language, values, and norms. 
a lot to take in.